you relax and, and take forget all the burdens that life throws at you because trust me every day you're getting something thrown at you and you just sit there and, and thank God where we are and these burdens are gone for at least for an hour once a week at least at one hour and uh, it's just a just a restful place to be uh, and it gives you time to ponder as well about being in the choir so if there's anybody who would like to join you know I have the one riser, I wish we could say, I could say it, that we have two risers, but we don't, because we never fill up one. Well, I shouldn't say never, but uh, if you've never stood on a riser before, it is such an uplifting experience. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But uh, we're going to turn to doxology, which is number 815 in our hymn book. And if you would, let's all stand together.
Are you sure? No, but I'm hoping. Like, hoping for a miracle. Uh, Maybe somebody else ought to get on the bottom. Roger, I'll scoot I'll catch you. Georgia, go to the other end to level it out. Uh, and then we'll pull teeter over there. Way over there to right. level that one out. Well, all right. Let's turn to hymn number 510. It's called, The Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. Oh, yeah. You'll sing the first and last. It's one and three on this one.
beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a beautiful day to be anywhere. Uh, and as we always say, you don't have to be here to be communicating with the great Creator. You can do that from anywhere you are. But it's always great to have you here on Sunday morning. And like Bob said, it, maybe it's just that one hour of the week that you do get that respite from the world. And as we call this a sanctuary, we worship in the sanctuary. It is a sanctuary from the world. We're kind of insulated, if you will, today when we're in here. But when we leave here, just take that comfort and relaxation to with you into the world. And before we have our communion this morning, uh, said way into that, I'd like to read from the book of Mark, from Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. And Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. bread represents the body of Christ. Remember him as we eat together. This drink represents the blood that Jesus shed for the sins of the world. Remember him as we drink together. Before we take up our offering, I'd like to read from the book of Matthew from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Psalms from Psalm 61. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Just verses 1 through 4 from Psalm 61. 
Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter <coughs> of your wings. Amen. What beautiful words. Hear my cry, listen to my prayer. Refuge in the shelter of your wings. Well, thank you again for being here this morning. And not a cloud in the sky, not even any of those little decorator clouds as the uh, weather people like to call them. Little puffy little clouds or just to make, uh, breaks up the monotony of the blue. But it's a beautiful day, the blue and the green. The, the horses were out there this morning when I got here, but now they, they've moved on to another part of, of the field. But it's a beautiful time of year, and we hope that all of you are feeling well enough to enjoy the weather. Well, before we start the message, there's the most important part of the service. And I, I certainly don't want to neglect that most important part, David, Tim. It's the joke of the day. And the joke is, what is another name for a bunch of bees? Bees! Bees! Bees to the star! Bees everywhere! Danger. Hi. Good answer, but wrong. What is another name? For a bunch of bees, well, a good report card. See, bees are good. Oh, my. Well, let me just move from the joke of the day, maybe to the quotes of the day, from Oscar Wilde. No man is rich enough to buy back his past. We simply can't do that. We just move on. And Benjamin Franklin said, in a time of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future. Now, we know that the meek inherit the earth, and meek doesn't mean mild or anything of that sort. But Benjamin Franklin says it is the learners who inherit the future, because as we know, if we don't learn from the past, we are doomed to repeat it. So, thank you, Benjamin Franklin and others. And we should learn something every day, shouldn't we? There's always something to learn, something new. I was going to say new and exciting. It might all, not always be exciting, but there's always something new to learn. It's never ending. And then I put a little article in your bulletin, God's Great Creation, and you can take a look at that at your leisure. Well, now that the most important parts of the message are over, uh, <laughs> this is what we have left. So, as we often do, we'll open the message with a question. If you put a paintbrush in Bob's hand, hmm. do you know what that paintbrush becomes? A mess. Another good answer. <laughs> well, it really becomes just another paintbrush. That's what that becomes. But if you put that paintbrush in the hands of Picasso, Monet, Rembrandt, if you put the paintbrush in their hands, you have a priceless work of art, Bob. Or let's say you let CJ, sit at the piano and play. Do you know what you get? <laughs> you get noise. Yes. But if you let John sit at the piano and play, you know what you get? Beautiful music. So the bottom line is, if you put what you have in the right hands, 
you get some amazing results. You get masterpieces of art. You get beautiful music, beautiful singing. I like this. I didn't even write this in here for today, but it just made me think of it. If you let me sing a solo in church, you know what you get. You don't have to say anything. But if you let Georgia sing a solo in church, then you get something beautiful. Well, with all that said, get your Bible or the Pew Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Easy to find. First book of the New Testament. Matthew 14. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 21. So you can follow along or you can just sit back and listen as I read these verses. Matthew 14. Verses 1 through 21. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, or Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish to answer. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So, a lot of people needing something to eat. Well, let's see what happens when we put what we have into the hands of Jesus, like we were talking about with paintbrushes and pianos and voices and all those other things. Let's see what happens when we turn things over to Jesus instead of us trying to do it. In verse 12, Jesus learns about John the Baptist's death. So he goes by boat, he withdraws, it says. He's looking for a solitary place away from the crowd. But the people see Jesus in the boat heading east. So the crowd walks on foot eastbound along the northern shore. And by the time Jesus lands on the shore, the crowd is already there waiting on him. Now, Jesus could have said to everybody, 
Folks, I am very tired. I need some time to recharge my batteries. I need time to pray. I need time to mourn the death of my friend, John the Baptist. And if Jesus had said that, I don't think anyone would have blamed him one bit, would they? In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. But that's not what Jesus does this time. Verse 14 tells us that when Jesus landed and he saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. He healed their sick. And the word translated compassion means to be moved deep down in your inner being. That's compassion. It says the same thing about Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion, that deep down feeling of care for people. Jesus gives everything that he has to the people out of selflessness. Matthew is showing us that there's a huge difference between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of Christ. Because Christ's kingdom is all about compassion and it's all about healing. And that is not always the way of the world, is it? The world is not always looking to offer compassion unless they think you deserve it. They're not always anxious to heal you unless they think you deserve to be healed. But Jesus knows that everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs healing. And so here, Jesus heals people all day long. And so the sun sets, the disciples say, hey, Jesus, this is a remote place. It's already late. So send the people somewhere that they can give them something to eat. I guess the disciples wanted to send them into town to go to the local convenience store. Or maybe there was a Kroger that we didn't know about. <laughs> but the bottom line is, the disciples said, hey, we need to just send them all their way. But what did Jesus say? He said, they don't need to go. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, I bet they thought about that for a second. But they're thinking, where in the world in this, what we call a remote place, are we going to find enough food to feed 5,000 men plus all the women and the children? Jesus has just given us an impossible task, and I would probably have agreed with him. In John chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus, we know it says, was testing them. He was testing the disciples. As it says in John 6.6, 6, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus already knew he was going to feed the people. But he wanted to see the response of the disciples. He wanted to see our response when we're in certain situations. He knows what's going to happen, but he wants us to answer that question and see what we would do. So Jesus sometimes gives each and every one of us what we think is an impossible situation so that we will lean on Him. So that we will go to Him for our help because that's the only option we have. That's the only option that the disciples had. How are they going to feed all these people? They knew they couldn't do that. He wanted the disciples to realize that they were in a situation where they had to totally depend on on him. So the disciples, what did they say in verse 17? Lord, we have here only five loaves and two fish. In John chapter 6, verse 9, this is described as five small barley loaves. And we've used this example or comparison before, these little barley loaves are about the size of those 
red lobster cheddar biscuits. You know those red lobster cheddar biscuits? Man, they are good, aren't they? I've not had one, I don't know how long. <laughs> so they're about that size. They're not that tasty, I will assure you, because this was the cheapest bread that money could buy, these little loaves. The cheapest bread they could buy, it was the bread of choice for the poor people. So it was not red lobster, cheddar biscuits. It was pretty tasteless stuff. The disciples are saying, hey, we're going to bring you everything we've got, but we still don't understand how we're going to feed 5,000 plus people because what we're bringing you is basically a, a little boy's lunch, a little girl's lunch, a little snack here for lunch. So they still don't know what's going to happen. But listen to what Jesus says. When the disciples complain about having only those little barley loaves and, and two little sardines. The fish are about the size of sardines. That's what you've got now. Five little tasteless loaves of bread and two sardines. So here it is. Jesus says, bring them here. Bring it to me. And I think we have to stop for a second so we realize what happened there. Jesus takes what they give him. Jesus takes what we bring to him. And then he multiplies it. If you bring him something, if you bring him your compassion and your care and your concern, he will multiply that compassion that you have. So you can extend it to many people. Into the lives of other people. Many people. And that's what he does with the little lunch pail here. He has the people sit down on the grass. Takes those five tasteless loaves. Those two sardines. And he looks up to heaven. And he gives thanks for them. He gives thanks for what this is. What they brought to him. Then he gives the bread to the disciples. And the disciples give it to the people. Now, some cynics say that what really happened here, folks, what, what really happened is that as Jesus passed out the bread, as the disciples were passing out, well, everybody then found their little lunch boxes that they brought with them, and so they opened them all up and everybody had lunch. That's what the cynics say. But you know how cynicism goes. But I think it happened just the way the Bible says, the way Matthew tells us here. Jesus passes out the bread, and every time they reach for another loaf, another piece, there it is. More bread to pass out. More sardines to give to the people. Now, some of us do like sardines. I don't know about you. I like sardines, and I think most of you here know that I love Spam. <laughs> so, if you ever want to give me anything, sardines and spam is just fine. Okay. But with that aside, every time he reached for another sardine, or they reached for one, there it is. There's another one. Where's, where are they coming from? And then verse 20, as we read, says they all ate and they were satisfied. Now, the word satisfied means to be filled up. If you're unsatisfied with whatever it is, you're doing or looking to be satisfied from. If you're unsatisfied, you are not filled up. But it says they are satisfied. That same word appears in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Jesus says, and you know these words, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for doing good, for the right thing, they will be filled up. The scripture tells us that everyone then ate, and what happened then? They had all those leftovers. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? You start out with these little loaves, a couple of sardines, and now you got 12 baskets of leftovers. That's not bad. Now, you had 12 basketfuls, and we know that there are how many disciples? And if they're all with them, there are 12 disciples. 
So every one of those disciples could take a doggy bag home with them. Every one of them could take a, a basket with them. And every time that they would have a leftover, they'd be thinking of that situation. In the months and the years to come, every time they would think about their problems, think about down the road after this event, months go by, years go by, but they can look back and they can say, you know, you remember when, when Jesus fed over 5,000 people with that little boy's lunch? Something they can always remember. And this story is not about how we can make a little go a long way. The story is about how Jesus can make a little go a long way. And our story today reminds us that there is satisfaction. We can be filled up. Everyone can be filled up who decides to follow Jesus. Look what he can do. Jesus says in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go thirsty, never go hungry. Everyone, not just a select group, but everyone in this world is invited to never be hungry or thirsty again. It is not exclusive to a certain group of people. This is offered to everyone who is listening to these words. All we have to do is say, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And then, after we say that, we then do what the disciples did. We take what we have and put it in the hands of Jesus. And so may we all put what we have into the compassionate hands of Jesus. We're going to have an invitation hymn this morning. And if you've not turned everything over into the hands of Jesus, then there is no better day than today. Our invitation this morning is number 638. I need thee every hour. And if you would, let's stand together again. to keep to ourselves because we know God is love Jesus is love and as we often say love is not love until we give it away our closing hymn this morning will be number 507 it's called something beautiful I just want to read that verse it says the son of mine was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found before we sing the song join me in the closing prayer Dear Jesus, we thank you again for allowing us to come together in your house and hear the words that Roger brought, sing his wonderful hymns. Let us take what we've learned and heard today and share it with the world. In his name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.